Good evening, everyone. <laughs> it's great to see you all here. Sorry. <laughs> I, uh, so for those of you who are expecting John, I am not John, obviously. Um, I'd like to welcome you back to our second lecture of the season here at the beautiful Huntington. Um, I'm Jeff Rich. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the Outreach and Education Lead and an astronomer at the Carnegie Observatories. Uh, we're very happy to have you all back, and uh, I wanted to share something with you for those of you who don't know. Uh, the, our observatory, Las Campanas Observatory, was featured in the New York Times. Uh, for those of you who've seen it, you know what a spectacular site it is, and if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to go check it out. Uh, the, the pictures are spectacular. It makes me miss going to the observatory because I haven't been in a while. Um, I also wanted to remind everyone that tickets for our next lecture, uh, next lecture will be live tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Abigail Polin, and she'll be speaking about a century of measuring distances uh, in the universe. So we'll be happy to see you all back here in two weeks. Uh, I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank the Norris Foundation for their support, which makes this series possible, and for all the folks here at the Huntington, uh, the staff and volunteers who make these events run so smoothly with us. Uh, and it is my great pleasure tonight to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Jane Rigby. Uh, after completing her PhD in 2006 at the University of Arizona and working there briefly as a postdoc, she actually joined us here in Pasadena at the Carnegie Observatories as a Spitzer and Carnegie Fellow. In fact, she gave her last lecture here at the Huntington in 2009. So not here, here, but here at the Huntington. Uh, I don't know if anybody was here for that, but you can watch the video online if you're interested. She spoke about uh, how she studied supermassive black holes uh, with all, using all wavelengths of light from X-ray to infrared to radio waves. Uh, and she continues to carry out multi-wavelength research as the lead of a large JWST program called Templates that's mapping star formation in distant lensed galaxies. Uh, after, after her time in Pasadena, Dr. Rigby joined space telescopes, uh, went to a Space Telescope Science Institute and joined the James Webb Space Telescope Project. Jane uh, was, uh, Dr. Rigby was so excited to work on uh, JWST, she was so compelled by the science that she turned down other job offers. And it was a rough time for JWST, so um, it tells you what an exciting telescope uh, scientist knew it was going to be even 13 years ago. Uh, it, in 2018, uh, Jane, became the, uh, Jane became the project scientist the Project Scientist for Operations at JWST. I wanted to get the title right. Uh, because her job is really important, she oversees the hundreds of staff who make the telescope run and make sure that we're receiving these beautiful images and data, some of which you're going to see tonight, and are able to do the spectacular science uh, in the, now and in the coming years. In fact, uh, you may have seen Dr. Rigby in the news before. Uh, she has been one of the champions of JWST uh, both before and since it launched, but especially since it launched. She's worked tirelessly to make sure that the data are great. And in July, when the first images were released last year, she was on hand at the White House uh, to reveal the first images with President Biden. So we're really lucky to have her here tonight to talk to us about JWST. She's received multiple accolades for her excellent work, including being named to Nature's 10 People Who Helped Shape Science in 2022, the BBC's list of 100 inspiring and influential women, and Out and Innovate's LGBTQ plus scientist of the year. So as I said, we're truly lucky to have Dr. Rigby here tonight to tell us about JWST and all of the great work it's going to do. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Jane Rigby. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. You could be home watching TV. You could be asleep, which is what I ought to be doing on East Coast time. But you chose to be here and to listen to that wonderful music. Thank you so much. That was, that was really a pleasure. And to come learn something about the universe and how we study it. So thank you for being here. When the telescope started working, I threw out my old talk and I threw out all of the artist's conceptions and simulations and I threw all of them out. <laughs> so pretty much everything in this talk is a real image from space and I'll tell you if it's not or it'll be a funky little cartoon, okay? But this one's real. This is actually two images stacked on top of each other. One is the telescope's own selfie, the telescope peering back at itself. 
And then behind it is one of my favorite images, a galaxy cluster um, that we're just seeing uh, our deep, one of our deepest views yet of the universe. Okay, so I want to tell you a story, and so I need to introduce my main character, and it's kind of a funny-shaped main character, so I want to get you to know what it is and, and what it looks like and why it looks so weird, and then we can talk about what it does and the, the story of getting it, um, getting it working and taking the images and the, the spectra uh, that it was built for. And then, as long as they'll let me talk, I want to show you what we're learning about the universe from, from this amazing telescope. Now, if you're used to Hubble, okay? Hubble, by the way, happy birthday, Hubble. Today is Hubble's 33rd birthday, so good job, Hubble. Um, I used to make jokes every time Hubble hit a milestone birthday. I don't know what to do with 33. It's reconsidering its life choices. I don't know. Um, you know, it used to be it could drive a car. It could, you know. All right. So, so this is, this is Webb, or Jabez T. This is a very different telescope than Hubble, right? Hubble is a tube, has a tube with a glass mirror inside of it. It goes around the Earth every 90 minutes in low Earth orbit. It was launched by the space shuttle 33 years ago. This is nothing like that. The Webb telescope is 6.6 .6 meters across, so that's 21 feet if you speak feet. It is so big it doesn't fit in its rocket. So we had to fold it up to get inside the rocket to get it to space. And so you can see there, there's the secondary mirror reaching, it's up at the top of the image, uh, and the mirror supports fold it up around it. And then there are 18 primary mirror segments. It is a segmented telescope. And then six of those primary mirror segments are folded behind the telescope for launch. Okay, so this is this funny beast. It doesn't have a tube, it is open to the sky. Below it is this five-layer sun shield that is the size of a tennis court. It's made of a thin plastic, it's a metallicized plastic that kind of looks like potato chip wrappers, okay? And it, this sun shield protects the telescope from the light of the sun. It acts like a SPF 1 million sunscreen. <laughs> For real, okay? I burn in like five minutes. I'm probably burning right now. And so I need some of this stuff. So, so what I mean by SPF a million is um, of all the light from the sun that is coming through the bottom of the sun shield, one part in a million gets through, right? So of every kilowatt that is hitting the telescope, a milliwatt gets through on the other side. And this allows the telescope to get extremely cold. So even though it's orbiting uh, the sun, the one side, nice and toasty, you can run solar panels, you can run computers. The other side is 40 degrees above absolute zero, which is minus 400 something Fahrenheit. But who knows what Fahrenheit means at minus 400? Let's just say 40 degrees above absolute zero, okay? So that is this funky looking main character. This is it in Los Angeles. As you land at LAX, you'll see a big uh, Northrop Grumman building um, past the runway, and it, that's where it, it was, it was a, um, they did the final assembly. Here's another view, so you can see how it folds up. There are these six mirrors, three on either side, folded behind it. Um, and you can see this was the final test. This is one of the tests of the sunshield that it really would deploy on the ground the same way that it needed to in space. Okay, so this is our brave main character, the Webb Telescope. So why does it look like that? So a couple more pictures, just so you can get a sense of what this thing looks like and what a weird beast it is. This is in the clean room at Goddard, uh, where I work in Maryland, and this is a, 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 a time lapse to see them moving it around, the engineers and, uh, and technicians moving it around to put it onto a stand so we could turn it sideways. You see the part that's blurred out? Ha, can't show you that part. Um, <laughs> So they blurred it out. Um, and you can start to see how big this telescope is, right? And so where it's looking right now is into a, a little viewing area in the clean room, uh, which I really loved because one of the great pleasures of working at Goddard was that at, on a lunch break or after dinner or after, you know, before you go home for the day, you could go over to the clean room and see how the telescope is doing. So the pieces were built around the world, the four science instruments, uh, two of them were built in Europe. Uh, one um, in the United States and one in Canada. Uh, they came to Goddard and were, were bolted onto the telescope. The telescope mirrors were assembled elsewhere and brought to, to Maryland and assembled. So we would go look at the telescope. And I have this whole scrapbook of, you know, of, um, of, of watching the telescope get assembled. 
This is, um, they told us, okay, we're gonna rotate the mirror, you should come take a look today, and everybody, cr everybody uh, crammed in. You can see me in the back there, and my boss, John Mather, and, and Garth Illingworth, and a, a bunch of folks uh, that just piled in to go see them move the telescope. And we're not doing any funny tricks here. This is just enjoying uh, curved beryllium mirrors coated with a beautiful thin layer of, gla of gold, and seeing how this, to get a sense of how beautiful um, how clean and how precise this telescope is. That's, that's our, one of our photographers, Desiree Stover. Um, <laughs> my kid, I would take my kid after hours and he'd go wave at the clean room guys. And we're like, stop waving, they're busy. And they'd always wave up at the kid. Like, you know. um, but it was, really amazing. it was really special watching this thing get assembled, realizing that it was going to be a big deal and nobody knew it yet. That was kind of this special secret that we had that, okay, we told everyone at every talk that, that we were allowed to give. We're building this amazing thing. It will be the most powerful telescope, 100 times more powerful than Hubble. We're gonna fold it up, fit it into a rocket, put it out into space, and it's gonna unfold in the dark and it's gonna work great, okay? Um, last one, I promise, of the getting to know you telescope shots here. The one on the left I'm proud of because I took it with my iPhone. Um, I just took the kid one day after work to go look at the telescope and they were rotating it. We're like, oh, that's really cool. So I was taking pictures. Um, and I asked my son if I could have this picture of him because there's a bunch of pictures of him as the telescope was being assembled. That's looking at the back of the science instruments. And I asked permission, um, is it okay, son, if I use your picture in this talk tonight? And he said, yeah, but only if you do another picture to show that I'm not a little kid anymore, okay? <laughs> So that was 2017, and this was later, this was <laughs> earlier today, sitting on the giant pile of mulch that was delivered while I'm gone, um, which he's earning chips, he's earning points by shoveling um, to watch extra TV. Okay, so remember this thing has to fold up, uh, so to fit into the rocket, it's a 6.6 .6 meter telescope, it's a five meter rocket fairing. So if, this is how it looked um, folded up. This is actually how we shipped it down uh, on a custom ship through the Panama Canal to French Guiana where it was launched on a French, on the Ariane 5 rocket, okay? So that's the telescope. That's our main character in the story. Here's the timeline for the story. And if you're a fan of XKCD, I hope you like this, and if you're not, ignore this. Um, what I'm ignoring in this talk, what I don't have time to talk about, is the left side here, the 20 years of development of designing this telescope that has to do this impossible task, building it, integrating the pieces of it, getting the weight down to only, only 6,500 kilograms, which is what, how lightweight it needed to be, half the weight of Hubble, to get into deep space. All of that I'm skipping. That's a bunch of other talks. Um, someone should really write a good book about it. I'm gonna start with launching it in, uh, on Christmas Day uh, 2021, and then the six month period of commissioning it, which is uh, commissioning is a science code word for let's unfold all of it and see if it works, and then let's try to get it to do science already. Um, also known as why none of us had lives for the better part of a year which we also did during peak COVID, right? We launched within a week of the Omicron uh, peak. Um, so in the pictures that follow, if you see a lot of masks, that's why, right? It was, it was as bad as, uh, as COVID got. And then science, six months after commissioning, we get to uh, our first science images. And as Jeff mentioned, uh, we got to go to the White House, which was pretty cool. And we're now 10 months into science operations of the first of what we hope are many years of science with this incredible telescope. So let me walk you through a little bit of that commissioning and then show you some of the science that we're getting back from this telescope. All right, but first, okay, there was no launch. I, I just made this talk. This is actually my first public talk since we launched, so thank you very much for being here. Um, and so, so I had to start from scratch, and I had my talk mostly done. I was like, how do I not have a launch talk? I don't, how do I not have a, a launch video? And it's because I didn't see the launch. I was in mission control in Baltimore. So I didn't get to see the pretty launch until afterward, and so I wasn't. So I put it back in, so I get to enjoy what the launch was like, and then I'll show you what it looked like from our perspective. Not as pretty, but, but at least as much exciting. And it had a soundtrack, and they were like, do you want to mute the soundtrack? I'm like, when do I get to talk over a big soundtrack? So this is in French Guiana. Um, this is where Ariane launches the rockets, Christmas Day. 
Um, just an absolutely beautiful launch, and then a quick montage of everything it took to get it to uh, to get to the launch pad. Did you see LA there? That was the 105. And we have engine start. And lift off. Décollage. Décollage. Lift off from a tropical rainforest to the edge of time itself. James Webb begins a voyage back to the birth of the universe. Okay, I promise this is the last one with the soundtrack, but I thought it was so much fun. Do you see the people with the, the Javis T hat on it? And then this is the telescope coming out of Quite the launch vehicle and the solar array coming out. And then some of our friends at Mission at uh, and we Launch have a Control. Fully deployed JWST observatory. And then this is back in Baltimore. So in Baltimore, okay, end of the soundtrack, I promise. So what were we doing in Baltimore? Um, this is our deployments team, the folks that were in charge of deploying the telescope. Um, for Baltimore, we were all on our little loops, um, waiting to be in control of the observatory. So launch was the, the job of, of Ariane Spas down in French Guiana. And once the telescope cleared its launch vehicle, then it was, then it was ours. Um, and that was a really special day. We got up, we were on shift at four o'clock in the morning local time. We launched at 7.20 local time. So if we look a little bleary in the pictures, that's why. Um, I got to be on console for, uh, for Project Science for launch. And these are my colleagues, Susan Neff and Mike McElwain. Um, this is the, at L plus 43 minutes after launch, we had like 20 seconds where we could take a thumbs up picture and then get back to real work. Um, and I pulled up the logs uh, we had a project science log, kind of like a Google Doc, where we were uh, trading notes back and forth about what's going on and how things are going. And um, I will say the most beautiful part for me was when the, uh, when the telescope left the launch vehicle, we heard on the loops that it was, uh, that it was uh, maintaining its position, right? It was damping out the motion from the launch vehicle. And we heard this wonderful sentence, sun is on the array, current is on the array which means we were getting solar power. If we hadn't gotten solar power, we would have had a two hour mission, maybe three, right? And then we're done. You got a solar powered telescope needs some sun. So that was the first of many critical deployments that if they didn't happen, we didn't have a mission. One of the most interesting parts of that first month was going to work thinking, well, either we have a, either things go well today or we're done. But we might leave today being like, well, that was a $10 billion you know, um, failure, not a success. And so this was the first thing that really had to happen. There's current on the array, there's power on the array. And for me, I love that, you know, I was, I was in, in mission control, they had some VIPs down in a little auditorium in the basement, and you could hear them cheer when, when, the, um, when the rocket lifted off. None of us cheered, because why do you cheer that there's a giant hydrogen thing that is, you know, <laughs> full of fire carrying your beautiful telescope? You cheer when it stops <laughs> on time like it's supposed to. So we were all really silent, and I will say that um, when, when the, uh, the engineer announced that there was current on the array, with as much emotion as you can possibly describe electrical voltage, okay? <laughs> I just... I started crying and it was like, then it really hurt because then people were very, very loud and we knew that, um, that we, we might have a mission after all. Uh, a couple minutes later, we sent our first command, do nothing. Try it on your dog tonight, do nothing. Okay. Um, but that's obviously the first command you say before you try to tell it to do things. Um, that worked and then we were in command of the observatory. We could start telling it um, to, uh, to do what it was supposed to do. It was a really emotional day. Um, of course, this is December 25th, uh, 2021, uh, absolutely peak Omicron. And so after we all got sh off, off shift, after 12 hour shifts, um, we enjoyed a, an adult beverage outside in the dark, like you did to be safe, um, and then got up at four the next morning. Um, but it really was like living a dream. Um, then, you know, we, I, I, uh, had, these are all engineers um, that have worked incredibly hard on the project, and I got to sit with them and um, just be happy that the first day went really well, um, and then check in and see that the, the thrusters had fired to send us to the second Lagrange point, to send us to where our orbit needed to be. So that was a pretty amazing day. Let's talk about uh, briefly what's going on now. So 
Firing those thrusters sent it to the second Lagrange point, which is about 1.5 million kilometers, a million miles away from the Earth. And so this is a little video just showing the orbit. So it is in orbit around the sun. It is farther than the distance of the moon. And it just stays there in that nice, stable orbit, farther than humans have ever been, um, in an orbit that lets us uh, explore the universe in a very, very stable environment. These are the scary deployments. This is everything we had to do. That's the first solar array. Uh, this is all sped up, showing the um, the, uh, the solar, uh, sorry, the, the sun shield coming out, the telescope lifting up off, the, off of the, uh, the spacecraft, the sun shield coming out and then getting, uh, full, the, getting tensioned up, the secondary mirror, and then finally the, uh, the wings of the primary mirror. And when this video came out, I very quickly learned not to show this video to astronomers at colloquia because they were uniformly like, well, that's never gonna work. <laughs> like, okay. But you know that all of modern astrophysics and in, well, much of modern astrophysics and a lot of NASA science is riding on all of that working. Like, it's never going to work. Like, we have really good engineers, and they test it a lot. But this shows you how much we had to do in the first month. I say we, that's the project. I'm a scientist. This was very much us watching the engineers and saying, you've got this, go, right, <laughs> and cheering them on. And then the, the, the scientists take over uh, for the next five months of the six-month commissioning process once we actually have some data. But that first month was very much the, uh, the engineers just doing a tour de force performance to unfold this telescope in the dark, in the cold, as soon as the sun shield started coming out, it got cold very fast, um, exactly like that video, believe it or not, except faster. Uh, they got it all done in, uh, in just a couple weeks, just tremendously amazing. And this is really important because it means we can build telescopes that are bigger than rockets. Before, the limit on any size telescope has been, if you want to put it in space, is how big is your rocket? And you can only make rockets so big. So if you think about Hubble, Hubble is exactly as big as you could cram into a rocket of the time. And the space shuttle was designed to fit something like Hubble, or at the equivalent pointed down. Um, uh, so that's how big it is, right? If we want to do bigger, if we want to see further, we have to build telescopes that are bigger than rockets, which was why it was so important that this thing unfold in space. And so if it isn't already obvious, I'm really in awe of the engineers on this project. And I really feel privileged to work with them. Um, and I was, reading, um, I was reading David McCullough's book about the Wright brothers, and this quote really struck me as being very true of engineer, our engineers that they had both just the tremendous work um, and common sense and so much passion to work on this project for so long. I have a selfish interest. I want the data. But for the engineers, it's all about the challenge of how do you do this seemingly impossible task and get it to work. All right. Lest you think that our lives are all launch videos and excitement, this is what we actually did for the six months of commissioning. Sit around conference tables, look at data, and say, huh. Um, that's, that was actual life. Um, hilariously for this, this is the check of whether the NIRCAM instrument was working uh, before we started trying to align the telescope segments. Um, and so for this, so that we had a videographer, so it still looks a little more impressive than it really should. But these are a bunch of my friends and colleagues. That's the PI of the NIRCAM instrument. It's our lead optics engineer. Uh, just a bunch of amazingly smart people around a table looking at the data and being like, well, this looks okay. Um, and, and then, because we were being videotaped, we, no, we clapped, okay. Um, <laughs> but, but this was, what this actually was, was the first opening up near cam uh, and saying, all right, can we see anything? Let's point at a couple thousand stars and see if we can see anything. Well, we saw a big blurry thing, great. Because when we launched the telescope, the 18 mirrors in the, in the primary mirror were not aligned with respect to each other, because if they were, launch would have rattled it out of place. So we designed it to be launched with the mirrors off by up to a centimeter, and then we would get them right in orbit by looking at bright stars and aligning the mirrors interferometrically. And it's a really cool process. I'm in awe of the engineers and scientists that figured out how to do this. And this is the first step in that, in which we had to go find the 18 blurry, fuzzy, out of focus, grungy little uh, star. Because when we try to look at one star, we get 18 blurry little stars. 
because each mirror is working on its own. They're not working together yet at this stage. Um, and I love this picture because it really shows how, okay, is there anything there? This is like late at night. Um, this is late at night in mission control. And then this is the flip side at the same time, but I took this one, uh, pointing toward Marshall there, who took the first picture, where we actually, uh, an hour or two later, where we started finding the segments. So we did a mosaic where we looked around the sky, and I, I'm gonna see if this plays, because I think this is fun. Um, so he's counting to 18, and we're kind of giddy and, and a little bit, we've been up too late, probably. Um, Seven, eight. Trying to count. Right, this is not gorgeous data. This is not data you show the president. But this was <laughs> this was the can we get this telescope to work like one telescope instead of eighteen? At the end, Marshall says, you know, we should we should number them, and we we did, and then started <laughs> of. And we started the meticulous, careful process of aligning these 18 mirrors so that they work like one telescope instead of 18. And it took a month. Um, we had contingency plans, we had binders and binders of contingency plans, and it all worked much more smoothly than we expected. And so on March 13th, we took this image, which was intended to just show that the telescope is aligned. Um, but actually, we took an earlier image that wasn't so deep, and then late, uh, late that night, um, three of us were in the control room, Aaron Smith, Marshall uh, Perrin, and I were in the control room. We were like, you know, that really wasn't a deep enough image to, and then we rattled off some totally plausible reasons that we needed a deeper image, but really, we were like, Okay, what does it look like? So we took this image, um, and I got this image, um, we, uh, the observations were attempted, they failed, we restarted them, and so Sunday morning, the data arrived on my computer, and I'm in my pajamas, and my parents are over, so I can't even use my guest, off, you know, my guest room office, and I'm like, um, and I open these, and I see it's just full of galaxies, right? This isn't even a deep image, this is only 2,000 seconds, so less than an hour, and it's just absolutely chock full of galaxies. And this is what the raw data look like. And for me, this was the, you know, have a big messy cry when you get a moment, moment, that, oh, okay, this thing's gonna work, and it's gonna work much better than, than folks have expected. Um, and so, and it's sharp. It's crisp and sharp right out of the bat. And so very fast forward to a couple months in July, I just took you from March to July because I wanna get onto the science. Um, we were able to take those data to the White House. And, there was, uh, what I'm glossing over is lots more of those conference rooms. So please fill in four months more of conference rooms <laughs> where we meticulously looked at all the data from each of the 17 instrument modes and each of the filters and gradings and combinations and just tr going through these long methodical checklists to ensure that the observatory was working. And there was a team of about 600 people that commissioned this telescope working ridiculous hours, working um, all from uh, folks from Canada, from Europe, from the United States. And it really just was a tremendous effort where we were all very aware that we were engaged in something much, much bigger than us and it had to work. Um, and then a couple of days before July 11th, I got a text saying, so do you want to go to the White House? And I was like, yeah, sure, fine, okay, when? Um, and uh, we got to go to the, the White House and present these images to the president and the vice president. And I'm not showing this image to be like, ha, 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 I got to go to the White House. I am showing it to say that it's really rare that science gets to be the top story. And I got a very strong sense um, of what a relief it was and what an enjoyable time it was for the president and the vice president to get to talk about science and not about um, you know, matters of state and, um, and, and international politics. It was really fun. We just geeked out about science for a while. And you know, they told me that like, don't waste the president's time, okay? Here's how long you may talk. Like, do you, do I have to use those remarks? Like, no, you can say whatever you want, but don't talk longer than this, okay. Um, and it turns out they just asked tons of questions. And it was a real chance to talk about, well, how do galaxies, what do you mean we can see how galaxies are formed and how they evolve? And we can see how stars like our sun 
uh, uh, were born. And um, it was really neat. And that's really what we're doing with astronomy. And so in the rest of my talk, I want to walk you through some of that. We are understanding our own place in the universe and how we came to be. Okay, you know, how the sun, our planet, how our galaxy came to be. How does it all work? And it's really, um, I would say, you know, it, it's certainly true that astronomy, I'm stealing a line from my old thesis advisor, George Rieke, astronomy is one of the rare times that good news gets on the front page of the paper or at the top of whatever media feed you get, fine. Um, <laughs> that good news gets any coverage at all. And it's also a sense of you know, a large team working together to do something that seemed almost impossible. Um, we certainly did make the front pages of papers around the world, <clears throat> just, a, just a small handful, um, including uh, El Mercurio the, from Santiago, Santiago Chile. Um, and, you know, these were beautiful images that we released in July. The president released the first one you can see on the Washington Post there, and then we released several others the next day. And since then, the data have just been pouring in. It has been so much fun. So. Um, I want to show you, so we got to do this little backstage thing. I took a couple backstage pictures. They built us a whole, um, a whole uh, studio so that we could do this, uh, this broadcast to share these data with the world. It was actually really fun, um, and I, I totally got to keep one of those cool little hexagonal coffee tables. I have it in my office, <laughs> and no one's going to steal it. Um, but it's really neat to just, to just kind of geek out a little bit and have, um, before going back to analyzing our data and making our, uh, our, our figures and, and writing papers, to just have a little bit of let's geek out with everybody that's willing to listen um, about what we're doing. So this is one of the first, uh, let me just, so this was fun, but let me just jump to it. So what are we trying to do here? The Webb Telescope was built to do four things. And we showed that it could do all four of those on the first day that we released uh, released images. The first goal, which is the one that sold the telescope, is to peer back to a time when galaxies were young, right? To see back in time to the first generation of galaxies, which is a nuts bold goal, but it's a thing we can do because that's how astronomy works, and I'll walk you through that a little bit. Um, and then, so let's just walk through each of these four goals, right? It is nuts that, that, is, that that's even possible, that we can see how galaxies um, are, are, are formed. And the reason for it is really simple, right? The speed of light is not that fast, right? Okay, right? Okay. <laughs> Who thinks the speed of light is fast? <laughs> All right, you guys. Okay. But the sun, which is super close, is eight light minutes away, right? If the sun winked out right now, it would take you eight minutes to notice, right? Well, okay, longer because we're in the dark, but fine. Um, <laughs> okay, Jupiter. Right? Jupiter is about, on average, about 40 light minutes away. Who cares? When you see Jupiter, you're seeing 40 light minutes in the past, but it's not any different. But when you start to look at, say, a distant galaxy, you are seeing, okay, let's pick something in the middle. Let's pick Vega, right? Dozens of light years away. So you're seeing Vega as it looked 20-something years ago, okay? So you can, if you want to look it up, you can find a star in the sky that is further away in light years than you are old, and thus you're seeing that light arriving the day you were born, right? Cool, right? It left the day you were born and it's been traveling through space. Everybody with me so far? Because like otherwise, I'm, like this is the key point here. It's the speed of light, not that fast. So when we think about distant galaxies, we are seeing thousands of light years. Let's take some very nearby galaxies. We're seeing thousands of light years into the past, so thousands of years ago. And we look at more distant galaxies, we're seeing millions of years, and then even with, tele with good telescopes, billions of years into the past, right? So when we look at the galaxies in the image on the left there, that's one of the, that was the image that President Biden released, the, uh, the white, the sort of white, uh, creamy galaxies in the middle, that light is arriving now. It left those galaxies about the time the sun was formed and it's been traveling through space for the last four billion years, okay? So, so telescopes absolutely are time machines, but not our past, right? We get to see other people's past, right? Um, the background galaxies we're seeing as they looked 10, 11, 12 billion years ago. And the reason is just that the messengers, the light, has been traveling through the universe in the meantime, right? And this is the really cool trick of modern astronomy 
is that we can take these so-called deep field images. Every galaxy in it is a different distance away. So every galaxy we're seeing as it looked a different, a different um, distance back in time, right? So we get these snapshots of galaxies. And we never get to see any galaxy evolve because we don't live long enough, right? Galaxies take hundred, you know, millions of years just to go around one time. We don't get to see them merge and change and grow and evolve. But we can see how galaxies looked a very, very long time ago by finding the most distant objects in that image. And then we can find gal galaxies that aren't as far away, right? And you can start piecing it together. So that's the game. And the really, the quick trick I've just pulled on you all is how do we know how far away they are? And the answer is that the universe is expanding. And so it's, as it expands, it stretches the light. Um, so the light appears red shifted, and we can use that red shift to understand how far away those galaxies are if we have a cosmological model. But I'm gonna sweep that under the rug right now. <laughs> Good. Um, and so you get these signatures, like in the, in the right here, um, you get these little spectral signatures that for any astronomer, those little three lines there are a hello, hello, I'm hydrogen and oxygen, hi. And they let, they're a signpost that tell you um, what, the, what color that light was when it left the galaxy. You measure what color you measure it at, and the, different, the ratio is, uh, tells you the redshift. So it tells you how far away that galaxy is, right? Okay, so this is to prove to you that we're not making this up, this really does work. Um, <laughs> And in fact, that bottom galaxy, let's see if I can pick out, it's the bottom one, uh, and you can see the little sign pointing back to where it is on the left-hand side. We're seeing as it looked 13 billion years ago. So we're, we really are seeing back to a time when galaxies were really young. The universe is about 13.8 billion years old, and we're seeing back, um, there it is at the bottom left there, um, we're seeing back to the first billion years of the universe's history. We're also seeing ridiculous things like this galaxy, which is just has these fireworks of star formation all over it. This is probably how things like globular clusters in our own uh, galaxy were formed. Um, so it's forming star clusters uh, real, uh, furiously. But this was one of the, some of the first spectra that we showed, and it was a ha-ha, this telescope really does work. Um, we're also studying that, that whole history of, of galaxy evolution, not just the formation in the first billion years, but the evolution over the subsequent 13 billion years, uh, and studying how galaxies form their stars, how they form the heavy elements in those stars, right? Which is good, because um, if you, you ought to be a fan of hydrogen, you, hydrogen's easy, it's made the Big Bang. Um, but oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon, which are things that are dear to our hearts, because we're made of them, are all formed in stars. And so understanding how galaxies form their heavy elements in stars and then recycle them into subsequent generations of, star, of, of stars. That's good, that made us. Um, we also study how stars and planets form. This is a stellar nursery. Uh, this is a, it's hard, so this is uh, the cosmic cliffs, a really beautiful image. You can see the baby stars peeking out of this image, especially along the ridge line, the shoreline of the cliffs. Um, and what you have to imagine, because it doesn't fit in the screen, is up the top, up of the top of the image, there are these bright, very bright, ultraviolet, um, just imagine these very massive stars that are pouring ultraviolet radiation into this nebula and, actual, and making those, uh, that, that shoreline, right? Just baking away all the gas. And so that's a process in which these new baby hot stars are destroying the cocoons in which they were born. And so star formation is actually stopping future star formation. But in that compression along the shoreline, new stars are forming. So there's this complex interplay of creation and destruction that's at work that we think is really important to how stars form in galaxies. We're also studying planets orbiting other stars. Um, to show my age, when I was in high school, we didn't know that there were any other stars that had planets. We now know that uh, there are thousands, and in fact, planets are about as common as, um, um, as stars. Equipment failure, one sec. Um, and we can study those planets in two ways. One, we can directly image some of them if they're far enough away from their parent star. That's really hard at present, but in some cases we can do it. And the other way is this little technique. Okay, that's a fake image, guys. Okay, you see it? <laughs> fake. Um, in the little cartoon, 
in which we have a planet that's passing in front of its star. And when it does, there's a little graphic there showing how bright is the star, how bright is the star, gets a little fainter, right? Because the, star, the, the planet is blocking a little bit of the starlight, okay? We can measure that, it's a small measurement. Uh, but we can measure that and we can in fact look at how the rainbow from that star changes, the spectrum, as that planet goes in front and is not in front. We take the difference and we can measure the, we can um, get the plot on the right, which is, tells us about the atmospheric composition of that planet. So we're getting a spectrum, we're getting a rainbow of the atmosphere of another planet. That's pretty wild. And so what you can see in the sort of, that's a messy diagram, but the point is that we're measuring lots of different molecules in the atmosphere of a planet around another star. And so this is going to be a really major science, it's already a major science um, driver for, for the Webb telescope, is understanding what planets are like and what their atmospheres are like. A much harder problem is figuring out if any of those could support life. That would require probably another telescope. Um, much of my work for this commissioning was in figuring out, okay, so how well does it work? And writing all of that up, and I'm really proud of this, so I put it up. This is our, uh, our paper announcing how well, the tel how well the telescope works. There are 600 authors. That's what those things show. They're just all authors. Um, I've never been on a 600 person, 600 author paper, so that was a, that was a new thing for me. I, um, but it was really trying to acknowledge everyone that worked so hard during the commissioning process. And this is the actual work that I did. This is measuring, um, this is putting it all together and measuring how well the telescope works. Um, this is for the astronomers in the audience. But the point is we're, hundred, we're more than a factor of 100 more sensitive than previous telescopes for both imaging and spectroscopy. So the telescope um, in the end is more sensitive than we promised and more sensitive than we dared expect. So, all right, a little bit more science. Um, this is, a, this is a, a graphical way to show that better performance. On the left is an image from Spitzer, a beautiful telescope that I worked on when I was here, at, uh, when I was here in Pasadena as a Carnegie uh, Fellow and a Spitzer Fellow, not coincidentally, um, and then comparing it with what we can do now with the Webb Telescope. And you can just see the difference in quality. It's so much better. And I love Spitzer, it was a great telescope. It was transformative. It was also the size of a large trash can that you take out to the curb, right? Like, it's a beautiful telescope, but small compared to this thing that is 6.6 uh, .6 meters across. Um, um, so just that's the, that's the leap forward that we're talking about in performance. The better way to show your performance is just to keep showing you data. This was, uh, early images of Jupiter showing some of the moons and its rings um, and the aurora, just fantastically good. Um, believe it or not, we originally were not spec'd to be able to track moving, to track planets, because they, you know, they move. Um, and it was, it was cut out for budget cuts. We got that back in. That was an important science goal for our planetary science community, and it really shows how well we can track uh, planets. We can, in fact, track um, planets moving about three times, planets and asteroids and other comets about three times faster than we originally promised. Um, this is Uranus, um, just a beautiful view that we haven't had since Voyager physically went there, right? And so the quality of the images that we're getting of these uh, outer solar system objects is comparable to, um, to missions that went there. All right, this is probably my favorite image so far. This is Abel 2744. It's actually several galaxy clusters that are all merging together. And if you zoom in, so I really encourage you to download some of these data. All these data that I'm showing are, are public on the, uh, the NASA JWST Flickr account is beautiful. And you can just spend endless hours, I have, um, <laughs> On Zoom, too, we're like, um, when these data came out, friends and I, we were just like, oh my goodness, did you see this one, did you see that? Like, it's just, it's such gorgeous data. Um, and just, this is, a, this is just really fantastic. Um, this is one of the deepest views of the universe so far. Um, we'll do, we will go deeper uh, in the next year or two. Um, these are some of the spectra, the rainbows, of these very early galaxies showing that we really can get back to the first half a billion years after the Big Bang. The one on the bottom right, which is kind of this boring little red fluffy thing, is a galaxy that its, uh, its, uh, its redshift tells us that we're seeing it as it looked 320 million years after the Big Bang. 
right? So <laughs> it's a baby galaxy. Um, and this is a, this, that's fantastic because that's exactly what the telescope was built to do. Um, this is another result that came out uh, shortly after. Um, I tried to get this tattooed and the tattoo artist didn't want to, they, they thought I was joking and like <laughs> stopped responding to my emails. Um, and now I'm like, maybe I should wait because maybe the next one will be still better. But this is, if, you're, if you care about spectra, if you care about what galaxies are made of, this is an, oh my gosh, you're kidding me, spectrum. Um, it's, you can see in it lines of hydrogen, of oxygen, of neon. Um, it is, uh, there's magnesium lines too. It's just, it's incredibly gorgeous. And by looking at these little, little spikes that stick up and how bright they are compared to each other, we can tell you what these galaxies are like inside. We can tell you how hot they are, how dense they are, how much they've been able to make oxygen versus just the hydrogen that was left over from the Big Bang. Um, it's just, oh, it, it's so gorgeous. Um, this is an image that is from my own program. This is from the program that I'm leading, uh, that Jeff alluded to, called Templates. Um, this, this is after it got the spa treatment from the folks at the European Space Agency. Um, they, uh, they cleaned it up and made it look really pretty. Um, these are my ugly versions of, of some of the galaxies that we're studying in that program. These are galaxies that have been gravitationally lensed. So if I go back here, all these white galaxies are, galaxy, are galaxies that are in a cluster and the red things we're seeing are actually behind the cluster, and we see um, they are, from our perspective, they, those galaxies are magnified. Um, the, whole, the whole galaxy cluster is acting like a natural telescope. It's a really cool trick. So by looking at these natural telescopes, we are getting galaxies that are magnified, distorted, and a lot brighter than they really are. Um, and so, so these are some of the targets from our program. It's just been both really fun to try to figure out these data and kind of confusing because it's all new data from a new telescope and we're working to understand how do, we, how do we understand it, what's real, what's instrumental artifacts. So I'm going to show you a little bit of these. I'm going to pick the one at the, uh, the second one, the second column. Um, this is like an Einstein ring. So here what you're seeing, okay, I did a fast one here. This is, this second column is an Einstein ring. So you have this background galaxy that has been magnified by that little foreground galaxy in the center. And light's coming up the top, out the side. It comes around from every direction. It looks like a ring. Einstein predicted this. Cool, we see that. Here I've subtracted the, the galaxy in the middle because it was in my way. So it made it go away. Um, <laughs> And on the left, you can see the data that we're getting from the Webb telescope. In the middle, you're seeing our model. And then in the far right is a reconstruction of what that galaxy would look like if it had not been lensed, if it were not having these funhouse mirror distortions. And so we're seeing two galaxies that are merging together, and probably as a result of that merger, forming something like a thousand suns worth of stars every year. So having this big burst of star formation because of that merger. We can also study that galaxy in the middle panel in its dust, in its little molecules of dust called pause. Um, that's never been seen before, and, and we've been able to see that before with Spitzer, but we couldn't see where in galaxies it was happening. And with Webb, we can see where it's happening. And then the right, that's a map of hydrogen, of the Passion Alpha line, which shows us where the new stars are forming in a way that can't be hidden by dust. So it's a way to understand how these galaxies are forming their stars. So that's the work, that's my, that's the work, my day job, right? This is the night job, um, um, is to understand how these galaxies are forming their stars and what that tells us about, about galaxy evolution. Um, and you don't want to know how long I could geek out at you about spectroscopy and about how we're understanding what's in these galaxies. Um, but the main result here, the main point here is that we're figuring out, this is a map here of comparing the oxygen to the hydrogen, that is really telling us about how you make oxygen in galaxies. Um, you know, Carl Sagan used to say that we're all star stuff, except for the hydrogen. The hydrogen's from the Big Bang, okay? But, if, but of all the water in your body, all of those oxygen mo molecules in the H2O, the hydrogen comes from the Big Bang and the oxygen was made in the heart of a star. Right? Ditto for all the carbon, the nitrogen, the iron that's carrying the energy around your blood. All of that stuff was made in stars, and we can understand those processes and how they, how they shaped galaxies over time. So I'm going to finish so I have time to ask questions, so I should have told you you should be thinking of questions. 
Um, but I can close by saying that you know, we expect um, a long and productive science lifetime with the Webb Telescope. We're only one year in, and we have fuel enough for more than 20 years. We had a great launch and a fantastic mid-course correction, so we have ample fuel, and fuel is formally what limits us. In practice, it may be how long the various pieces of the telescope last. Um, we've measured the performance, we've demonstrated the capabilities uh, almost across the board. It is working better than we expected. And we're at this really fun time where we know that it works, we're getting discoveries, you're seeing it in the paper, you're seeing it in your social media feeds, but most of the big discoveries haven't happened yet. Those data are being taken right now, and people are working around the planet to understand what they're telling us about the universe. Um, there's another telescope, the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope, which will launch in 2027, which looks like kind of like a stubby Hubble. It'll see a much bigger field of view than Hubble. So it will be able to find rare objects that we can then study with, with JWST. And one thing that's very exciting to me about the success of the Webb Telescope is that it shows us how to build a telescope that could tell us whether we're alone in the universe. Um, the, the first recommendation, every 10 years we figure out as a community in astronomy, what should we do? What's the most impactful thing that we could be doing? And the recommendation from 2020 was that we go, decide, we go learn whether we're alone in the universe. Um, that would take a telescope that looks a lot like, like Webb, a bunch of hexagons, folds up to fit in a rocket, unfolds when it gets there. Um, but that would work in the kind of light we can see, the optical and, the ultravi and then in the ultraviolet. Um, and it would study something like 50 planets uh, um, orbiting, you know, sun -like, uh, orbiting sun-like stars. So 50 planets that ought, seem like they're Earth-like orbiting 50 stars that seem sun-like and see whether any of them show signs of life. That's a really challenging science goal, but it's one that is, you know, would have profound consequences to find out either that we're not alone in the universe or that we looked at dozens of planets and we can't find any that look like our Earth, which would tell us something about how rare and difficult it is to, um, to get life going. So I'm gonna close with these thoughts. Um, so three big takeaways. By far, the Webb Telescope is the most powerful telescope that has ever been built, and it's even better than we expected. Um, my heart is full of gratitude for the something like 10 or 20,000 people that built the telescope um, and the 600 who commissioned it. Uh, it really is amazing how much people poured their hearts and minds and years into the mission and how much their families and friends um, supported them through that process. And what's really fun for me is that the discoveries are only just begun. Um, so please, you know, come along with us. Um, we are uh, uh, are um, both on all of our social media feeds, um, on, I love our Flickr account personally because it has the really high res pictures, uh, but we are um, in this process of discovery and we want to keep telling you about it um, and bring you along with us. So thank you for listening. Thank you so much. That, that was spectacular. As a user of JWST, thank, thank you for making it work. It was great. Um, if you have any questions, please, we have a couple of microphones. We have time for a couple questions. And if, you, if you could stand up and head to the microphone so we folks on streaming can hear. Do you mind? <laughs> Thanks. All right. Over there, do we have someone? Go for it. Uh, deep field images, it seems like anywhere you point this, you're going to see something spectacular. How, how do you know where to look? How do you know where to look? Yeah. Okay. That is a great question. Like, it was planted, but it was not. Okay. <laughs> um, how do we know where to look? We argue a lot. No. Um, believe it or not, the main way that we know where to look is that we invite the community, the, the scientific community, um, which is basically to write proposals about where we ought to look. And those are called observing proposals. And it's a PDF, you know, it's a, a document in which you say, I think we should look here because. We should look at these 10 stars because, and then the following reasons for why that's important and what we would learn. And then that has a, um, 
it has a computer file along with it that gives instructions for the telescope to where to look. So we did that process um, recently, and we received 1,600 proposals for our second year of science. And we have time to accept about one out of every seven of those proposals. So basically, people gave us seven years of observing, of observing ideas, and we have one year of the telescope. So we're going to reject six out of every seven. And I'm, say, I'm wincing because I'm writing those proposals, right? I think we should point here. Uh, and most of us are going to lose, but some of us are going to win. And it's, it's kind of brutal. Uh, but it is a process of peer review in which we bring in 200 experts. They were actually meeting last week um, on Zoom, um, actually blue jeans, and they, <laughs> in their little breakout rooms, and they talk about the proposals that they've read. They grade them, and they talk about them, and they advocate for them, and they argue with them. And in order to get rid of the, uh, the implicit biases in the process, the people reading the proposals don't know who wrote them. We scrub, the names are all removed. Um, and then, so it's a secret process, and you're not allowed, if you're on one of those panels, you're not allowed to tell anybody, so they can't lobby you, right? So it's done in order to get rid of the biases about who, whether they're famous or not, or what they look like, and just focus on what's their idea? What stars do they want to look at? What galaxies? What deep fields? For the deep well, fields, if, it's, it's... What about e the deep fields? Because anywhere you look, it's dark. You yes. don't see any galaxies. I mean, how do you know there must be millions of these? That is a places. great question. So how do you decide where to look for the deep fields? Because as you said, anywhere right. you look, it's going to be full of galaxies. There's a couple ways to do that. One, you can go a place we've already looked before. So a, so a part of the sky that's almost like a national park that has that has, seriously, that has great data from Hubble, from, um, from Magellan, from Keck, from our other telescopes already, from ALMA. And just going longer. Just and then the other way story. to do it is to pick parts of the sky that are extra, extra dark. And in fact, many of these national parks, these very dark skies, are the parts of the sky where there's the least amount of our own galaxy getting in the way and the least amount of our own solar system in the way. So there are a couple spots that are just the darkest spots on the sky, and not coincidentally, those are some of the places we target for deep fields. Okay, thank you. I'd like to add to that by saying, um, I'm not a scientist, but I'd like to toot the Carnegie's horn by saying we have no fewer than eight Carnegie scientists having time on the James Webb right now. So that's quite a, a but remarkable... But we didn't know that when we selected them, see? Right. <laughs> see? No, you didn't. <laughs> And one of them is Dr. Rich, Jeff Rich. Yep. And the other thing I'd like to say is that it's barely 100 years since Edwin Hubble, Carnegie astronomer, discovered the existence of Andromeda. It was thought before that that the Milky Way was the entire universe. And 100 years ago, this October, Hubble discovered the existence of Andromeda. So the universe was discovered here in Pasadena. <laughs> Thank you for being here. That was fantastic. Uh, how far back in time do you expect to be able to see? That is a really good question. So the question is, how far back in time do we expect to be able to see? Um, there's two parts to it. How far back are there galaxies? At some point, we're, we, there's got to be a time when it all turned on. And before that, there weren't any galaxies because they hadn't had time to get their act together. Right? The idea is that the gas in the big, yeah, there's, there's a big bang. Gas is cooling after the Big Bang. There are um, small, small places that are denser than everywhere else, and those, are, those density, uh, over densities are the places where gas starts to accrete. It's really hard to form the first stars because it's hard to cool that gas because there aren't any of the heavy elements that we're made of that are good at cooling, but eventually that gas is able to cool through some, comp some sort of not easy to do processes, and you can start forming the first stars. If enough of those stars form at the same time, then you would call that a galaxy. And if there's enough stars together, then we should be able to see it with, with the Webb telescope. Mm -hmm. So at some point, there must be a time, if we look further and further and further and further and further back in time, when there aren't any of those, where they haven't, there's just, there aren't any. Um, so that would be one limit, that there aren't any galaxies to find. And then the other is just going to be, you know, how deep we're willing to stare. In the first year, uh, we don't have very many deep pointings. I think our deepest pointing is like 30 hours in one place. So barely a day uh, per filter, and there's multiple, multiple colors of light. Um, so we eventually will probably start doing some deeper pointings, which then will go deeper. 
but it's this trade-off between back to this, how do we decide what to look at? Do we look at one place really, really, really deep for, for like, the, we could just spend the whole year doing that, but the people who want to study the exoplanets would get kind of mad at us, right? Because mm -hmm. um, they want to, and we, we need, because we're so, in a typical day with the telescope, we're doing five or six different things. We'll look at an exoplanet before breakfast, and then we'll go study a nearby galaxy, and then maybe we'll do a deep field for the rest of the day. Uh, and then we'll take some calibrations, right, as a nightcap. So it's a very... <laughs> um, so, so the telescope is, is doing a lot of different things, and part of what I'm doing is I don't know the answer, nobody does. Our models before launch weren't very good about what would be out there. That's why we built a telescope, to go find out. But we'll figure it out, and we'll be able to say, okay, galaxies really started getting their act together, and the seeds of galaxies really got started at this many hundred million years after the Big Bang. And that's, that's a result I'm really confident is going to be very rock solid coming out of this telescope, because we're finding them so easily. Wow. So just a quick follow-up. The longest that it's stared in one place is 30 hours so far. Sorry, can you speak up a little? The longest it's been staring into one spot so far is 30 hours. It's like 30 hours. I think that's right. Yeah, but don't, I'm not, I think that's about right. Yeah. Is there a blanked out space for, you know, a week? Um, well, someone would need to write a proposal that wins to do that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I'm on it. I'm and, on it. you know, I mean, anybody in the world can. You just sit down. I think that we should stare, right? Um, and, um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, so someone, and people make those arguments, and it's a very difficult process of all of these great ideas and figuring out what is the most likely to get us really transformative results. Um, and it's a messy process, it's not a perfect process, but it's, um, it's how science works, right? It's peer review, in which you say, which, which of these ideas do we think is the best? And I should mention, that process is not restricted to nationality or institution, you don't have to just work at NASA or just work at Carnegie. It's open to anywhere, anyone in the world, including countries that don't particularly like us. Um, we want to have the best ideas from the whole planet uh, uh, as to where to aim this telescope. And then all of the data go public. Um, some of them are secret for up to a year so that the teams that came up with those cool ideas can, can get the benefits. Um, but after that, all the data are public, so anyone in the world can download data um, and, and play with it and figure out what, um, what, what it's saying. Thank you. A question from streaming? Yeah, so we have a bunch of questions coming in uh, online on our, we have a few hundred people watching on streaming. Luckily, you've answered most of them already. Good, all right. <laughs> but uh, we do have someone asking um, what, if anything, um, JWST can tell us about dark matter and dark energy. Dark matter and dark energy. Did I not met? Okay, thank you. Um, so, if you're an astronomer, you spend a lot of time controlling this urge to do, like, walk to, into random people on the street and be like, "Are you aware that we don't know what 96% of the universe is made of?" <laughs> you are. See, astronomer. But if you do that to random people at the Albertsons, they like make you leave. <laughs> It is totally true that we don't know what 96% of the universe, of the mass and energy in the universe is made of. Um, we, we, we couch that ignorance by calling it dark matter and dark energy. And they're like, great, what's dark matter? Uh -huh. um, we see that galaxies, and we've known about dark matter and dark energy, we've known about dark matter for a long time. Fritz Wicke, a Caltech astronomer just uh, up the road, um, figured out that uh, clusters of galaxies act as though there's a lot more mass there than, we, than, is, than is, has lit up. Um, and then Vera Rubin uh, showed that galaxies are ro individual galaxies are rotating as though they're a lot heavier than the light we can see. And so, you know, we've known about this stuff called dark matter. We know from studies of the Big Bang, um, of Big Bang nucleosynthesis, of studying the elements that came out of the Big Bang, um, that there's a lot more dark matter than luminous matter, the kind of stuff we're made out of, stuff in the periodic table. It's really a mystery what this stuff is. Uh, presumably it's whizzing through you right now, but it's not doing anything. It just passes right through. I know that weirds me out too. And um, again, like Albertsons, right? You're like, hey, are you aware? Um, dark energy is even weirder. Dark energy is this thing that, so, so, um, uh, Erica mentioned Hubble discovering Edwin Hubble, the guy, um, 
and humans in discovering that the universe is expanding, the galaxies are all flying away from each other. Well, in the 90s, a set of astronomers, including folks from Carnegie, set out to measure how fast the universe is, how that expansion is slowing, right? Because of all the gravity from all the galaxies, they should be attracting each other, it should slow down that expansion of the universe. And instead, they got the opposite result, that the galaxies are flying away from each other even ever faster and faster. This makes no sense. Nobody understands this. We parameterize our ignorance by calling it dark energy. <laughs> we don't know what it is. It actually is an unsettling idea, right? That, galaxy, that there's something in the universe driving the universe to expand ever faster and faster, right? Uh, um, you, you can come up with theories to explain it, but they're really kind of after the fact. So that's what these things are. I hope this keeps you up at night. I hope that you spend some time tonight being like, oh my God, I'm staring at the ceiling and I don't know what dark energy and dark matter is. Great, congratulations, you're an astronomer. What, JVST can, what the Webb telescope can do every time that we study one of those galaxy clusters, we're studying dark matter because all of the, uh, almost all of the, the matter um, that is doing all that cool bending and warping is dark matter, not, not luminous matter because there's more of it. So one way to study dark matter is to study clusters of galaxies, to study that process of gravitational lensing and to see where the mass is. That doesn't tell us what dark matter is like what it's made of, but it tells us where it is and how it behaves. Dark energy, I think there are some gains that can be made with, with, uh, with Webb, but the real gains are gonna be made with the Roman telescope that NASA is building uh, to launch in 2027. That telescope, its main bread and butter is to understand how the universe has expanded as a function of time and to understand how dark, matter, how dark energy behaved in the past. There's no, there's no guarantee that'll tell us what it is, but it'll tell us how it's acting, which could rule out a bunch of theories of what it might be. Two more questions over here. Um, what are, type of data are the instruments collecting and what is, like what are each of the instruments on the web like getting for us in terms of Can data? you repeat the question? Sorry. What type of data are the instruments on the web collecting and, and what is that for? Okay, so there's four instruments on, on the web telescope. Uh, there's NearCam, built at the University of Arizona and in California. Um, that's an imager. It took this image. It looks, um, what it actually takes, this is the spa treatment image, okay? It's been through the spa treatment. Um, we actually take one color of light at a time. There are these filters, which are nothing like, but you can think about them as like colored filters that you would like put in front of a stage light to change the color, mm -hmm. right? Um, but it's the same effect, right? They only let one color of light through. So we have a big filter wheel and it turns and it lets just a certain color of red through and then it's an infrared telescope, so a different color of red through. Um, and so we take like this image is, oh, it's more than four or five. It's a bunch of these filters one at a time um, that, is, that are then layered to make a pretty multicolor image that our eyes can see. But what the data actually look like is like this, but in black and white and one color at a time. And then we stitch it together. I say the spa treatment, but like I can show you the raw data and you'd be like, yeah, okay, that looks, like, looks fundamentally like what you're seeing here. It's just, it's, it's a nice digital camera picture taken with a very fancy digital camera hooked up to a 6.6 .6 meter telescope in space. <laughs> That's what the imagers do. The MIRI, uh, the MIRI instrument um, built by the European Consortium does imaging and does spectra as well, the rainbows, in the mid-infrared, so five microns and out, much, much redder than our eyes can see. Um, the, spec the spectra um, look like little rainbows. They're really cute. Um, and, the, uh, and then the near-spec and the nearest instruments uh, take a cut. Near-spec takes imaging. Again, it looks like a, a monochromatic picture. And then it takes little tiny rainbows of every galaxy in the field, which is really fun. You can go to these deep fields and take a little rainbow of each one and see how far away each of those galaxies is all at once. It's really clever. Um, and then the same for near spec, where it can take, you can actually choose which of those thousands of galaxies in a deep field you want to peer at and just choose them and then take, get the rainbows just of those. There are these little quarter of a million doors that can open and close and just show you the parts of the universe that you want to look at. But how you get the data, um, you know, it comes down, oh, you get an email. It is like, 
the least romantic process on earth, like off earth. You get an email saying your data have now been taken, and then you can log in with a username, and now I forgot my password, you gotta go look <laughs> up your password, and then, you, and then they send you the data. Um, and it's, you know, it, it's not that big, because we have to send it all the way back from further than the distance of the moon. Um, so you can fit it all on a little hard drive. And we spend lots of time as astronomers making this face, and then that face, and then that face, trying to get it to behave and to get rid of the, the parts of, that are in the data that aren't from the sky, that aren't from the universe itself, but are from the telescope or the detector and making those parts go away, or at least understanding them, and separating them from the, the signal that comes from the sky, so that we can understand what we're getting from the actual universe, not from the telescope we're using to observe it. All right, last question. Um, yes, you mentioned that the fuel is gonna run out in 20 years, and I'm already sad about that. Um, with the fuel, what kind of fuel is it, and why couldn't you use solar power? Oh, okay. Um, so we do use solar power. There is, a, um, there is a nice solar panel on the back of it. It generates a couple kilowatts, and that's how we power the telescope. Um, <clears throat> but we need fuel uh, for, for momentum, actually, not for energy, but for the momentum. We need to push the telescope periodically. It is orbiting um, at, oh, am I brave enough to pull up the slide with the, oh, I'm not, I'm not brave enough to try to pull it up. Um, <laughs> So we're orbiting um, 1.5 million kilometers, million miles away, um, orbiting the sun, following, following the Earth. Um, and believe it or not, that giant sun shield, the sun, the, the light from the sun pushes on the sun shield. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it pushes a little bit more in one direction than the other. And we could pick the balance point that, it, that perfectly cancels that out, but that's not where we want to point. We want to point at where the people wrote the best proposals. So, so gradually the telescope builds up momentum, right? It builds up, which still blows my mind that, 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 that's, that solar photons contain momentum because of course they do because quantum mechanics and it, yes. So, so we have to periodically fire the thrusters to, uh, to untwist the telescope basically. So there are, mo there are reaction wheels, big flywheels that, take a, that, that counteract that, that push keep the telescope pointed, but eventually those, rea those reaction wheels are spinning too fast and we have to fire the thrusters to slow them back down. We also have to fire the thrusters to stay in orbit around the second Lagrange point. It's not a stable point in our solar system. That's good, if it were stable, all the space debris, all the asteroids would get there and I don't want that, right? Um, so it, it's, um, but we have to spend energy to stay in orbit around that second Lagrange point. So every couple months we fire our thrusters and formally that's what limits the lifetime. Mm, Personally, I would say that I'm not so worried about the fuel, so I think you should lose sleep about dark energy, lose sleep about dark matter. <laughs> um, but, but don't lose energy about the, but, but this telescope's not gonna last forever and I don't know and nobody really knows how long it will last. Um, it is out in deep space, periodically it gets hit by micrometeoroids, we're measuring that, most of them are quite small, we've gotten hit by one that was kind of big. Um, it's fine, like we, but we can measure the little change in uh, the quality of the mirror before and after. Um, we also have all these rotating mechanisms. Every time you change filters to change the color of light, you have to turn something. That something is 40 degrees above absolute zero, and so that's, um, you know, that, that is a mechanism that we hope will last a long time. And it's got computers and batteries and all of this stuff on board. Hubble's doing great at 33, and I hope that we will have a long lifetime with Webb, but nobody knows how long that will be. All right, we're gonna squeeze in one, we're gonna squeeze in one more question, one more question, because no. I, 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 I can't stop hearing about how great this telescope is, and I didn't wanna leave out our people Thank online. you for letting our online audience ask one more question. Uh, this is a little bit of a loaded one for a Carnegie audience, but in a post-JWST world, is there still a need for ground-based telescopes? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, that's a great question. Okay, so there's multiple ways to answer that. Um, I think about our facilities, our telescopes, as it's like an ecosystem. And I could stand here and tell you, I need this tree. I only need this tree. And you're like, but a forest? Like, it, it, it is, there's this complex way in which these different observatories um, interact to get us the science. 
when we decide where do we point, where do we point the Webb telescope, oftentimes it is at the places that other observatories have told us are really important parts of the sky. So stars that are doing something really weird, galaxies that have extra big black holes or that have, I didn't even talk about black holes tonight, oh boy, um, um, or that you know, are, are really compelling targets. Much of that work is done by large surveys studying large fractions of the sky. You know, the Webb telescope sees only a little, little tiny piece of the sky at any one time, right? If you hold a dime at arm's length, it's like smaller than the eyeball, right? Um, and so we're never going to see the whole sky. So you need these big surveys like with ground-based telescopes to tell us where to point. There are also things that we can do with ground-based telescopes that we simply can't do in space. Uh, for one thing, we can, uh, we can build telescopes that are even bigger, um, and we can pioneer the kinds of instrumentation that is the future of what we would build in space, but is not yet stable enough or working well enough to work in space, but it's good enough to work on a mountaintop where if it breaks, you can come at it with a hammer and a wrench and you can fix it, which is one of the beautiful things about ground-based telescopes, right? We can experiment, we can innovate, um, which we really can't do as well in space just because of the time lag between mission to mission. So I think there's a really complex interplay. Personally, a lot of my work has been combining, tele combining data from Magellan um, or from Keck to tell us what the hot stars are doing. And I can't get that data from the Webb telescope because it can't see blue enough. So I can see what the hot stars are doing with the ground-based telescopes, and then I can see how the galaxy is reacting to those hot stars, what the gas is doing from, from Webb. And that interplay is a lot of what's gonna keep my postdocs busy for the next couple of years, and it's something where what you get from using multiple telescopes combined is much more powerful than you can with any one telescope. Let's thank Dr. Rigby again. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.